so where we left off is we had just completed the ROI for our adult client. So again, just really quick review. Typically we have electronic signature, attached PDF and signed paper document as our ROIs. Um, with the COVID-19 virus, we are allowing verbal consent as well. So when we do verbal consent, there's gonna be one additional step we want to do. We'll go over that next. For minor children that their parents are signing consent, we wanna record their ROI as household. Their start date will match their parents' start date, but the end date will either be the same or their 18th birthday, whichever comes first. And if we have anybody on the call that is uh, part of one of the runaway homeless youth programs for an, for an accompanied, unaccompanied minor for those projects, we can um, have private profiles. We also need to have private program enrollments for, for those individuals. So a few things to show you on the ROI is about adding new ROIs also. Uh -huh. So I'm going to go into my cl our client record and show you how to add a note, which will, if we're doing a verbal consent. Zero, eight, zero. Sorry, I'm just making sure I got my chat box open so I can catch any questions as they come up. So going back into my client record. This is where we'd look. Uh, it would look like once we're done. Again, we have profile, programs, history, all of these tabs. If I had done a verbal consent, I'd also want to put a note here. And so when I write this note in here, that'll be the sample we do. I want to make sure that I'm putting the date and the time and um, that I obtained a verbal consent and this is why. So I'll, um, there is a question, what do you do for a child under 18? Uh, their parent is signing the ROI um, on their behalf when the parent signs theirs and we record it as household and the end date is either the same date as their parents or the child's 18th birthday, whichever comes first. If it's an unaccompanied minor because they are uh, going into a runaway homeless youth program, um, the what we'll do is um, we will, let me think this one through. The permission is we would say yes and then sign paper document so we can have them in the system. How, however, we would need to make their program, their, their client record private as well as the program enrollment private because when the youth does become 18 and they can sign consent, then we'll want to get that, but we'll want to make sure the, that the program enrollment as a runaway youth remains private. So to get into a um, an ROI screen after we've done it, what I want to show you is we're going to the client privacy shield, which is on that profile rec uh, page and that shield icon, we're going to click on the client privacy shield. It then takes us to this screen and you'll see privacy and then just below that release of information. This is where if they had said, yes, you can enter my information into HMIS, but I want you to make, I don't want you to share my information with the partner agencies. We would then select private and hit save changes. When we do this, and it looks like we have some sort of weird error. It could be very well that our vendor is doing some interesting things that they've been adding things with the COVID-19 virus. So I've noticed some things being a little wonky. But again, if I wanted to have a private record, I should be able to click on private, the underscore then happens. And when I hit save changes and it works, which I'm hoping it will this time, and it's not. So I'm gonna to go to another record to show you how that looks.
So I'm just on another test client. So again, I'm going to go to the shield. And this client record, what you'll see is data is used by other agencies, so it will not let me make this private. So this is where when someone revokes consent, why we have to make their, their, their programs anonymous. So let me find another one. Sorry, I need to find multiple test options to Okay, so we're going to try it on this one. So again, I would just click private, hit save changes. And it appears that we have a vendor issue. So typically what we would see is this would turn green, this underscore would stay under private, and then right here we would see a padlock. I'm going to see if I can find a uh, this client here, this test client, you'll see the, the padlock listed here. This denotes that this is a private record and that the record was created under this training agency and only agent, only staff within the training agency can see this record. So when I go into this record to show you how it looks, you'll see that there is a padlock here on their profile screen. And then when I go into the privacy, we will also see it here. If I wanted to make this now a public record because maybe when we worked with them, they were apprehensive about sharing their information. Three months later, they want to get a referral to another program. We recommend resigning the new, a new ROI with giving permission to share their information with partner agencies so we can make that referral. You can then come into the privacy, client privacy shield, click on public, and hit save changes and then it will now make this record a public record. Um, once it's a public record and other agencies have touched it, meaning they've maybe added a note or a program enrollment or services or an assessment, that record is now essentially used or owned by two agencies and it can no longer be private. We would then have to make it anonymous if they revoked consent. Okay, I'm going to go back to my new test client. And I want to show you something regarding ROIs. If an ROI was um, expiring, again, they're good for seven years, but we do have folks that have been in the system previously and their ROIs could be expiring soon. If you are working with a client, you see their ROI is expiring, let's say in the next six weeks. If you're working with them and you and you have them in your office, it is okay to get an ROI before the other one expires. However, the system does not always like overlapping dates on an ROI. So for example, here would be one that if they had an ROI that was signed on January 31st, 2015, and it was expiring on January 31st, 2020, and in this example, we are saying that the date is October 1st, 2019. The system would not let us put in this new ROI for this date range because of the overlapping dates. So what we would need to do is go into this ROI here and adjust this date to the day before our signature. So that way the ROIs would match up. So I hope that makes sense to folks to kind of show you how it looks. I'm going to go back into my client. I'm going to the pri client privacy shield. And what you'll see is here's the ROI that we did earlier. And let's say I needed my ROI to end at the end of this month and then start a new one because I am um, on this one they did not want to share but now they do want to share. I would go into the here and edit it to the day before they're changing their, their permissions. I'm going to say that they changed it tomorrow. I'd leave everything else alone. I do not need to re-sign the document and I would hit save changes.
and it appears our vendor is doing some things with permissions so it's not working at this moment uh, what would happen afterwards just to kind of show you the date would change to 4 11 2020 and then I'd be able to add my new ROI by going to the release of information here clicking on the plus sign and if I ended the date on the 11th then I'd need to start my new one on the 12th and I can say and here's the verbal consent now so I'm thinking that our vendor is updating things as we speak so that's why we're getting a few wonky things today and then I would hit save changes and then I would have the second ROI here and these typically would have dates that match up and not overlap so we have our, our adult client and in today's training we're going to add a child record as well um, I go with the child because I want to show you the difference on the ROIs um, however this process would be the same whether it's um, with couples or partners or spouses uh, and the reason why I review all this information with everybody is what I have seen as an HMS administrator is we do have staff that move from different programs to different programs in their jobs and we do see staff also leave agencies and go to other agencies and therefore have different access roles so I want to be sure that uh, everybody is trained fully so that way if they do shift in their within their agency to different programs or if they leave their agency and work for another one that they can re get access to HMIS without any hiccups. Okay so the next thing I want to do is go and create the child for this client. So to do that, I'm going to go back to my search button. And while I'm here, I now need to add the client. So just like we did our adult, we add children or any other person into HMIS the exact same way. And I'm going to use again a fake number. I'm going to get the pop up again in a second. It's going to ask me what I like to load that client instead. I do not so I'm going to hit cancel and in this example I'm going to say that my kid was born on January 1st, oops, 2005. And because they are 15, we do get the sexual orientation question for them. Um, zip codes for kids can be different from parents so be sure you're asking this as well and then it's going to ask me to put in the release of information so if my parent was signing today and I'm going to actually go with the 12th one because that was one where they gave us the full permission it's going to put the end date on April 12th 2027 however in three years my child will be turning 18 so we do need to change the end date to their 18th birthday the easiest way that I recommend folks do that is obviously their 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 18th birthday is January 1st and then the year they were born is 2005 so I recommend is taking the year of their birth adding 18 to it and then you've got the their date of birth for their 18th birthday then what you want to select is household and so this is how we are recording the ROI for a minor child when their parents signed um, 
when we do this, the parent is also having the same permissions as their child. When we're all done, we hit add record. And so now we, we do have that there, our changes have successfully been made. And if I want to go back to my adult, I'll need to go to search and find my adult here and click on their, their name. And now I'm back in my adult record. So here's my test adult. And one of the things that I want to point out is we've added two records, but right now they're not attached. We know that they're in a household together, but you'll see that there's they're not actually attached yet. So in order to, to attach folks into households, we call this the global household. What we want to do is go to manage. And once I'm here, I'm still under my adult record. I always recommend that when you're managing a household and you're adding folks to a household, pick the person who's going to be the head of household and start with that record. The person you pick is going to be the head of household should always be an adult. Uh, the only exception is maybe you're working with the runaway homeless youth and you've got a 17 year old parent. Uh, so then that 17 year old would be the head of household and their infant or toddler would be or their child would not be the head of household. So once you're here, we have a few different things. So just like on the client search screen on the right hand side, we have recent searches and you'll see that this is a much larger list than on the client search screen. So I can either click on records here or I can search for their name here. So if I search, the system then will give me uh, any possible matches. So a couple things to point out. Um, here's my Tina 2 test kid, the one we just, we just created. There's an add button, but if I go to this one, there's a join. Same with on the right hand side, here's my Tina 2 test kid. I can add them by clicking here. When I see this half circle with an arrow that's joining, what that means is if I click on here, I am taking this client and joining them to this person's household. And then this person will not be the head of household. It'll be the head of household of whoever that was, is the head of household in that, in that global household. Being that I want to not do that, I want to add my client. I can either click the add button here or here. When I click add, um, and this again, we've got some wonky stuff going on. This usually says add to household. Then we have member type, and then we have the start date. The start date will always default to today's date. This is the start date that we are starting the household in HMIS. It's not necessarily the date of birth or date someone was married or they got together. It's when we are joining them in a household in HMIS. Um, so for example, if you're working with a couple and maybe um, they were separated for a while and then they got back together and now the other person is joining the household, you're gonna go when they join HMIS for HMIS purposes. So even if they uh, got back together a week ago, but now they're joining HMIS because they're going to be enrolled in a program together. It would be the date that they're enrolling the program together that you would have the start date, not um, this is all about HMIS stuff, not necessarily outside of HMIS. Then for member type, we have a whole host of things. This is really about helping us quickly understand the composition of the household. And being that we're adding the kid, we have we want to select um, son or daughter, or we can scroll down. We have um, stepson, we have stepdaughter, we have um, child. So we have some gender neutral um, options down here as well. I'm just going to select child and I'm going to have my start date be today's date and then I'm going to hit save. Now what you're going to see is on the right hand side, what has popped up is we have household members. We have our adult here and you'll see that the member type is not set and we have an asterisk. What this means is this denotes this person as the head of household for this global household and then we have our child. So we're not quite done. We do need to set the member type. So to do that, I'm going to click on this edit button and I'm going to set this one to parent. 
and then I'm going to hit save. And it's really that easy. Um, if I want to say that someone is joining their household, uh, maybe I want to pick another test client. Um, I'm going to say that Here we go. We have another test client here. I'm going to click the add. On all these other ones, it would be combining these two households. And I don't want to combine them with another household. I'm just saying this person here is joining my household. So again, I would hit add. It's going to ask me their member type. Uh, maybe they're a roommate. I'm going to hit save. And then they're over here. Uh, when someone leaves a household, it's just as easy. Uh, if this person was leaving the household, what I would need to do is first select a new head of household. Uh, to kind of show you how that would look is I can click on this edit button and you'll see head of household. It will let me select any of the people who are in the global household. So if I needed to change it to here, And now you'll see the asterisk has moved from um, Tina 2 test adult to the parent test adult. If I want to put this asterisk back here and remove this person, I will click on the edit button, pick my new head of household, and click on this. It looks like a click and slide, but it's just a click. And now I'm exiting them from the household, and I'm going to exit them um, tomorrow. And hit save changes. And what we should see happening is um, the asterisk changed. If I adjust the dates that they join the household, say um, yesterday, actually let me do this by Wednesday and that they actually exited on Thursday and hit save. You'll see that they're gone. So it's really easy to um, add and remove folks from households. If I needed to put that one, that person back, what you'll see is um, Here's my household history where it says, hey, they were part of this household as a roommate from 4.8 to 4.9, and it will allow me to put them back. All I have to do is hit add, and I'm going to put roommate and save changes, and now they're back. Are there any questions about the household information? And I'm going to let you guys uh, put your questions in chat for a moment. I'm just going to see if I have anything over here. Okay, I don't have any questions on the household. So I'm going to go back to my um, profile on my adult. So when I click on here, so I have a few different options. If I click here on the right, it's taking me within this, which I don't want. This is for editing um, 
member types, but if I want to go to the profile, I can either click here on the profile or if I click on the actual name of the person, it'll take me to their, um, their profile. Okay, so now that I'm back on the profile, what you're going to see is here's my, my profile record and under household members, I now have both household members here. Um, once we're in a profile record, clicking on the right will take me to the other person's pro, uh, record. So if I click here, you'll now see that I'm in Tina2 test kid and my adult is listed here and if I click on the roommate I'm now under parent test adult record here. So it's a really nice easy way to toggle back and forth between different clients. Okay now let me see what is next. So what we just did is we created a global household. We identified who the head of household was. We set their member types. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you're working with a multi-generational household, um, if you have a parent, grandparent, and kid, just try to keep in mind that um, it makes sense. You wouldn't want to select um, your, if your head of household is the parent, then um, you wouldn't want to say the grandparent is also a parent. Otherwise it looks like it, it, it's, two parents to the kid. So just keep in mind that this is really so it makes sense when, when other staff folks are looking at it. So you can say grandparent, parent, and, ch and, and child or, or son or daughter. Okay, so here are the next things we're gonna review. So we've already done the profile and we've added clients. We're gonna look at the history tab, files, contact, location, notes, services, assessments, and referrals if we have folks that are um, sending referrals. Um, where I'm going to start us is the contact and location. Uh, kind of reviewing back to when we added a phone number to the profile, we want to make sure we're also adding information into the contact and location tabs. Uh, I have a, a few folks here that have joined that have previously attended the new user training and there, and there are questions about the vignettes. Um, if you're one of those folks, I'm not going to be answering questions specific to creating or editing your vignettes during this training. I did set up two Zoom meetings next week where I will help folks that need assistance with passing the vignette section. Uh, for today, it's just reviewing the training from start to finish. All right, so going back into my client record, and I want to go to contact and location. So I'm going to start with contact. So up at the very top, that's about four tabs over. I did put in a phone number. Here's my phone number. I can copy and paste things. And so I'm going to go to contact and I want to add a contact. Very easy. You click on the add button, add contact to the right. Um, you will see contact type and it doesn't, it appears there's a drop down, but there is nothing added here. The reason why is contact and location used to all live in one tab. And so there were some varying things before. So the vendor had to put it in this way, but there is no other option. We wanna put in the phone number and I did not have an email, but if I got an email, let's say I can put in And then I have that this is an active contact. And then we have this toggle that says private. So earlier this morning when we talked about privacy settings and how we can make various things throughout the um, HMIS private, this is one of those times where we could make a contact phone number and email private. So only the agency that's creating it would be able to view it. To any other staff person in any other agency, if we, had, if we make this private, it will not exist to anyone else. To show you how it'll look. I'm going to select private for now. I'm going to select today's date and then we have a note section. 
So um, where this is important, think of your notes as instructions. So if this is a phone number and email for a client, maybe this is only a message. So you can say, for example, message phone only please only leave your name and number. And so this would be just instructions that someone else would need or in case you had forgotten what the instructions were, this would be your reference as well. When you're all done, you're going to hit save changes. And if I click back on the contact, that'll take me back to that home screen on the contact tab. And now you'll see here I have my contact. And what you can see in here is um, this is the client name, here's their phone number, here's their email, uh, the date it was added. And what you can see here is there's a uh, padlock. So that means that if I'm right now, I'm in my training agency, if I switched over to another agency, um, then this would disappear. And then I have the little dialog box here. So it will give me the note within this. I can also edit this by clicking on the edit button to the left. And let's say it's now okay to share this. I could untoggle the private, hit save changes, and when I go back to contact, the padlock is gone. Nothing else has changed. Now let's say that this information is now bad and it's no longer active. We don't want to delete it. What we want to do is we want to untoggle active contact. Hit save changes. When I go back to contacts, it doesn't show up here, but I can, there is a thing that says show inactive contacts. And so I can click on this. And then the contact comes back. And let's say that this information is now um, valid again. It's really easy to move it back to being active. I click on the edit button and toggle back on active contact and hit save changes. And you'll see it's back. Next, I want to show you is location. So location, we have two different types. Um, we have hard addresses we can enter in or field interactions. So to kind of give you um, an idea of both, right now what we have is we don't have any um, locations recorded. <coughs> um, the map does give us various options. We can expand the map out to, currently it's on imagery, we can do imagery hybrid. Let me just take a second. <clears throat> we can do streets. And essentially what we're getting is the bubble on that's showing up on the map is um, it would be your agency's main office. So for folks that are working out in the field, if you on your electronic device, whether you're using your smartphone or your, <clears throat> or your tablet, you can do a, a field interaction and you wanna be sure that the GPS settings are turned on. And so what you'll do for that is right here, you're gonna see this little arrow. You want to, um, you'll see it says for the most accurate geo geolocation using the locate button on a mobile device with GPS technology is recommended. When I click on this arrow, a little pop-up will show up and it's going to give me an address. It doesn't give me the option to cancel. It only gives me the, the okay. What we have found is occasionally the address is a bit wonky. So what you would need to do is hit okay if it's a bad address, so here you can see here's here's the address. Um, it will say the staff person that did it. It was a field interaction at this time. If this address was bad, meaning uh, we consider a good address is if it's within 100 yards, then you will hit delete if you don't like it. 
it's going to ask, are you sure? And then what you can do is you can add it again. And if um, what we have found is typically if you get one bad address, when you do it a second time, um, it'll reset and you'll get a better address. And so then if we like it, we leave it alone and we can move on. To add an address, what we would do is we click on the plus sign. And then for address type, we have multiple uh, things in here. We even have last permanent address, so we can record that here. We can also um, home, work, school, mailing address, encampment. So let's say it's an encampment. Um, we can, it also will ask us to, to name it. So we can keep the name the same or change it to something different. Uh, we could use, for example, intersections. So if I want to say How Avenue and Arden Way, be sure to put in the state and the zip code to the best of your knowledge. It's going to, for today's date, again, this will be an active location. This works just like the contacts. Same with private. Um, for notes, again, this could be instructions. Um, maybe what we want to say is uh, tent is behind the open lot. This is, again, we want to give folks instructions so they know where to go if they're looking for this person. Um, maybe they have dogs and you want to be aware. You can say client has two large dogs. Again, this is all about instructions, so we're keeping everybody safe and able to locate folks. When we're all done, hit Save Changes. And I'm going to go back to my location tab, just like I did with the contact. And what we'll now have is here is that bubble where we typed it in. So if we scroll in, we should see that this is pretty close to how Arden. Let me go to street so we can verify that. Here's how Avenue and here's Arden. So it got fairly close. Um, if we wanted to edit this one, what we might want to do is if we know what this one of the street addresses is here, we can put in that address. But you'll see here is the, the address. Here is the staff person that did it. Here is what was named and the date. And if I wanted to make any one, um, this one I can only delete. This one I can edit. And right now it's showing active. If I want to turn something to inactive, again, all I need to do is turn off the inactive, turn off the active location, hit save changes, go back to the location tab. The bubble has now gone because the system is going to default to only showing us active addresses. But if I want to see inactive, I can hit search. And it's given me the inactive one, or I can ask to see all. Or I can say I only want to see addresses. And when we say addresses, we're really talking about when we do the entering the hard address. Or if I want to see just field interactions. So again, where this is important is if we need to, if we don't have phone numbers and emails and we need to physically go out to where someone has been staying so we can let them know of a housing opportunity. Uh, this information is also used for the point in time count for writing up maps when we do that. Um, the point in time count in, in January, so we know where to send surveyors out to. 
all this information is very important for that. Any questions on contact or location? Um, just so you know, for field interactions, this is something that outreach programs should be doing every time they're meeting someone out in the field. Um, or if you're another staff person that meets clients out in the field, um, we are asking that folks do a field interaction so we can record um, the movement of folks in our communities. Okay, notes. So we want to review the notes tab next, which um, we can add client notes and we can also add public alerts. So what I'm going to give you the sample on the client note today is we're going to pretend that we did the verbal consent. So going back to my client and just to the right of location is notes. And to add a new note, it's very easy. You'll see client notes here, add a client note. When you title things, it should always be short, sweet, and simple. Um, if we're doing long paragraphs here, it'll be very cumbersome for someone to figure out what's going, going on very quickly. Save more of your detail for the body of the note. So I'm gonna say verbal consent uh, obtained and um, time tracking. This will give you hours and in, in minutes. This is how it looks. Uh, where this could be helpful is if you wanted to write a note that um, you were looking for their encampment or something and it took you 20 minutes or I don't know, it could, this could be anything where if you want to put in the time that was associated with your note, you can. Uh, otherwise, we'll, with this particular note, if I just want to say, hey, I obtained kernel, verbal consent, say, I reviewed Really quick note, I just said I reviewed the HMIS consent form and the client agreed to have their information entered and shared in HMIS. Verbal consent was obtained to, to maintain safe social distancing. Once I'm all done with my note, um, I have the option of making it private. Again, if I make this private, only folks from my agency will be able to see it and then I can hit save changes. If I click back up here on the notes tab, now you'll see my note. Uh, you cannot see the body of my note unless you go into it. So again, here's the title, here's the agency it was created by, here's the staff name, and here's the date. I can click on the edit button, and then here's my note. The other thing we have here are public alerts. Um, so this by nature is just what it is. It's about alerting the public. What we use public, public alerts for in our systems is if the coordinated entry departments are trying to reach somebody for a housing referral and we don't have current information or current locations to find them, we may put out a public alert letting, uh, to let folks know in case they come across this client that, hey, coordinated entry is trying to reach them because they have a potential housing referral. Uh, other times we use public alerts is for health and safety risks. So for example, maybe we're using this because we were meeting with our client and they were um, suffering from their mental health symptoms and were expressing suicidal ideation and then they disappeared on us. So maybe we write a public alert saying, hey, this person um, has not been in contact with us and the last time we've seen them, they were um, unstable and expressing suicidal ideation please, if you get a hold of them, have them contact me. Those are times that we would use public alerts. And so what we're gonna do to 
to create a public alert, we're going to click Add Alert. And I'm just going to say Health and Safety. So again, this is supposed to be short, sweet, and simple. Uh, here's the agency that's creating it. And then there's an expiration date. The expiration date is not about the note expiring, but what, what the, a note, the alert generates. So it is going to generate a alert bar on the client record. And I'll show you what that looks like after we're done. Expirations should be no greater than 90 days uh, because we don't want to keep public alerts on people's records for very long. And if at any point you created a public alert and now it's no longer valid, like maybe you end up, they end up coming back and everything's fine, then you want to remove or change the exit date or the expiration date. So that way the, the banner comes off the client record and I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm going to have the expiration date be tomorrow. And your notes again are is about instructions of when someone comes across the client, you want them to, this is about giving them instructions of what they need to do if they come in contact with the client. Scroll down, you do have the ability to make public alerts private. I'll explain in a moment when we would do that, but for right now I'm going to hit save changes. And what, when I go back to notes, here's my original note and now here's my public alert. Now what this does is when I go to my, my profile page, when I click on, on here, you're now going to have this yellow banner that says public alert. This client has been issued a system wide alert. Please review the notes for full details. When we do public alerts, this does not send out emails to everybody in HMIS. It doesn't send out um, phone calls. The only thing it does, it puts the banner on the client record. So in order for someone to know that there is a public alert for a client, they have to actually go to the client record. So that's really what it's about is just uh, if someone so happens to come in contact with them, they open the HMIS record, they see this alert, then there are instructions. Um, to get to that particular note, so if we say, hey, here's a public alert, what's going on? What do I need to know? If you click on this little arrow, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, it's, a, it's red when my mouse is not there. When I click on it, it'll take me directly to my public alert. And it'll give my, uh, and then again, ideally you should have your instructions on what you need to do if you're in contact with this client. Times we make it private. Um, where this would be appropriate to make a public alert private is when the alert only applies to your agency. So for example, um, if you are a provider that is running a shelter and maybe your client doesn't get along with a staff member at that shelter or another client at that shelter. Um, it may be appropriate to write a public alert saying that these people need to be kept separated. And that would be a time that you can write a public alert, but make it private because it would only apply to your agency and your shelter. Uh, if I wanted to change my expiration date so I can take it off, I'm going to put it on um, yesterday's date and hit save changes. And now when I go to the client profile, you'll see that that banner is gone. Does anyone have any questions about notes or public alerts? And I'm not seeing anything in the chat boxes. That's where I'm looking for my questions. So the next thing I want to show you briefly is client files and forms. And so um, what we have under the client files, this is where we have client provider documentation or the homelessness certification documentation that Sacramento County COC needs. We also have client forms, which is the VI SPDAC consent form. And we even have elect an electronic version of the um, revoking the consent form. Uh, most people will be like, well, why would we have that there if they're revoking consent? Their signature is identifying information. And what I will tell you is I ask folks to put it there 
because I need it in order to start the process of de-identifying the profile. It is something that once I'm going through the process of de-identifying the profile, I do remove those forms and store all that information in a secure place so we know that we received the form revoking consent. Um, when we are uploading files, um, we only want to modify a, a, a file to correct it and we only want to delete files that we know do not belong to the client, the household, or do not belong in HMIS at all. So for example, um, I came across a few months ago, uh, we had a staff person upload a client's debit card. Debit cards have no business being in HMIS, so it was something we, rem we removed. Um, mental health assessments and physical health assessments do not belong in HMIS. HMIS is the Homeless Information Management System. It is not a medical record. Uh, when we're adding or uploading files, we have um, categories and names that are um, drop down, and I'll show you those. And essentially what you would need to do to upload a file is you would need to save that file on your computer first. And we do have the option of adding files and making them private so only your agency can see it. And then for forms, again, what we have on there is the VIS that consent form and revoking consent. Uh, HMIS does have the ability where we can build forms for other folks, but we are limited to signature lines and check boxes. So going back into HMIS, I'm on my adult client. And what you'll see here is files. So I've clicked on that, and this is where we can add files and forms. So to add a file, it's very easy. You hit the plus sign. You want to select your category, and what you'll see is we have quite a few categories to choose from. Um, you can select, for example, identification documents, and then we have plenty of predefined names. So again, please review these before you select other. What other does is it gives you a text field to type in things, which is great if we don't have it. But what I can tell you is we have lots of different things in here. And when we stick with the predefined names, it is much easier for us to run system-wide reports. Text fields uh, where it gets very hard to know what we're looking for. People misspell things, they put things in different orders, they use different punctuation, which then affects reports. So again, please try to stick to the correct category and predefined name and stay away from other whenever possible. Uh, if going back into identification documents, if I wanted to say that um, I was uploading their driver's license or ID, again, this is something I would have needed to scan and put in my computer. I would then select my file. It'll take me to my file explorer. I select the file and hit open, and then I can, um, I can make that record private. Again, this is where it only it would only be it would only exist to my agency and not to any other agency. And I would hit save changes. I'm going to go to another client record really quick to kind of show you what the files look like. So when I'm in here and I go to files, here's how it'll appear. A couple things to note, um, this particular record only has two files uploaded. I have seen client records where they have over 20 documents uploaded into their record. Here's the cool part, here's the not so cool part. The part that's not so cool is it's uploaded in the it's in the order it was uploaded. It is not ordered by alphabetical name or category name. So the oldest one is always at the top and the most recent document is always at the bottom. If they have over 20 documents here, I think the page will show eight and then you'll end up getting pages down here to flip through. Uh, this little double box means that this is attached to various other projects or program enrollments because they need this document for their program. So you can, uh, within a program enrollment, link to these documents so that way your, your program has the documents it needs for eligibility or audit purposes. And then down here we have client forms. 
and you can see here are all the different BI spit out ones we've done for this particular client. This works just like um, the electronic or HMS consent form. You click on add form. You choose the one that you want. Um, for the training agency, we have three for every, uh, once you get into your own agencies, you'll only have two. The reason why the training agency has three is we have both the, um, the Sacramento COC and the yellow COC VIs for that consent form. To add these, it's really easy. You click on the form and you can hit add, or if you select this, you, are, you can upload the scan version. That's all I've got on the files. Let me see what's next. Assessments. So the assessments tab, and just to show it in here is a little over to the right. And so what we have in HMIS, we have um, essentially seven different assessments now, depending on your agency. So typically what you're going to see is when you're in your own agency, you will see three different VI spit out forms. That's where you'll find these. We do have the training on Monday and this afternoon, um, actually during lunchtime, I'll be sending out the link for that training. Um, but for the VI spit out with the, um, just to kind of give you a little information, um, we have three types. We have families, single adults, and transitional age youth. Those are our options. For families, it's for all households with at least one adult and one minor child, and we only need one VI for that for the entire family. Then we have single adults. This is for any adult age 25 years of age and older with no minor children as part of their household. If we're working with, for example, a couple with no kids, then we would do a single adult VI for that for each person. And we have transitional age youth or TAY, and these are for um, TAY youth with no children as part of their household, and they need to be, be between the ages of 18 and 24. On Monday when we review the VI spadats, there'll be other details we'll go into at that time. Uh, but just to kind of show you what we have is in the training agency, we have B2s up here and then we have this the um the vi spit out essentially what it is is or code and community solutions created the vi spit out and there are multiple versions the vi um when you see this this is v1 or version one and then if you see v2 this is um the new tool that they created uh, about a year and a half ago sacramento county will be moving to the v2 uh, we are currently using V1, but I expect in the next couple months to be transitioning out of V1 and, and to V2. Yolo County is using the V2. When we do the training, I go over both. And then the other assessment that um, we have in the Sacramento COC is the shelter survey assessment for the COVID-19. Um, that only lives under the COVID-19 agency and we do have a specific training video on how to conduct that survey. So if you are a person um, on here today that needs access to that, you'll need to please send me an email at hmis at sacstepsforward.org and I can send you the link to that training video. What I like to tell folks up here where you see all of these, these here are not the assessments that were conducted with this client. This is the menu of the assessments that your agency is offering. It's kind of like if you walk into a restaurant and you sit down at the table, the waitress comes over and hands you your menu. You don't typically order everything on the menu, it's just what's on the menu is what that restaurant has to offer. On the bottom part where you see assessment history, this is where you will see the, the assessments that were conducted or to use the same analogy, the meals that were ordered and received. So on this particular client, here's where we have the COVID-19 response shelter survey. Um, we have the um, VI, V2 one version and the V1. This is one client we do a lot of testing on. If you're looking at this, this again tells you the name of the assessment, the agency that did it, the date it was done, and if there's a scoring feature to it. So for example, on the VI spadat, 
Um, there are five categories that there is scoring. There's general, which is just age. And then there's history of housing and homelessness, risks, socialization and daily function, and wellness. To give you an idea of the scores, for families, the highest score is 22. For Tay and singles, the highest score is 20. And so um, if that's the total score, as you can see, these um, categories, would none of them would have more than five points associated to them. So when you see a category, for example, like wellness scoring four, then um, this is where I recommend using this information as a case management tool. So if they have a high score in that area, then it may be that you need to get them connected to primary care or mental health uh, services or substance abuse services. It's, that's really how you can use this to help guide your work. Um, what we do ask is when you see that there are scores associated with assessments, please do not give the score to your clients. So even if, you, if they've had a VI SPDAT and you see they have a score, please do not tell them that information people tend to get hyper focused on the score thinking that if they scored very high they should have had a housing referral um, this is only one of many things we consider when we're prioritizing folks for housing uh, if when you're in here and you see an assessment like for example on this one you wanted to know how did they answer these questions to receive this score you can click on the edit button to the left and it'll take you into the actual assessment and it'll show you how they answered all those questions. Uh, the only other thing to share with you is eligibility. So for Yolo County folks, one thing to point out for you is um, Yolo County is using the community queue feature in their coordinated entry. So if someone is experiencing homelessness and they have a VI SPDAT for, um, assessment conducted, what we want to be sure to do is that they have an active community queue referral or they have a referral to a housing project. Uh, there are two ways that we know that. Uh, one is on their profile, and what we'll see is if they have an active community queue referral, it'll say it here underneath their, their picture and their, their UID, or they'll say program referral as client has a pending program referral. You typically would not see both of these listed. It would be one or the other, so they don't need multiple referrals. They only need one. The other place we would find that is under history. And I think that's the tab we're gonna review next. So let me just double check. So for history, and I'm staying on my Lindsay test client so I can show you some things. This is a client that we, again, we do a lot of testing on. So I want to um, let you know that what you see in here is not typically what's possible in any one ZOC. But if I go to the history, which is just to the right of programs, I now have a history of program enrollments, services provided, referrals, reservations, which is part of services, and assessments, which would be anything on the assessment tab. So this is the any history that's all kind of smushed together, no matter what agency um, provided it, um, it'll, you'll get the full list in chronological order here. So these are color coded. So greens are assessments or the surveys, blues are referrals, whites are services, and yellows are program enrollments, and pink is a reservation. This is again around services. Uh, so we don't see too many of those. Uh, to kind of give you some information of what we're seeing here on this page, um, you'll see if it's a referral and it's blue, it'll tell you referral. Here's a community queue one. 
here's the date that it was sent to the community queue, here was the date that it ended. So if you're a Yellow County folks, if you were only seeing this, then you'd be like, oh, they don't have a community queue referral. Then the next thing is looking at, do they have a housing referral? So for example, um, if they have a referral that's pending, then we don't need to send them back to the community queue. Uh, other things on here to show you is this little box, the little double box. That means this is, this is a service that is connected to this program enrollment. This is a survey that was uh, connected to this program. Dollar sign here, this is the amount that uh, was recorded for this service. So this was a rental assistance and the expense amount was 1400. Uh, sometimes what we'll see is a little dialogue box with notes. I'm not sure if I have any of those ones here. Ah, here we do. Uh, here's one. And again, when we put our mouse on the little dialogue box, the note will appear to the right. So we don't have to go into it. We do have over three pages of history for this client record. Uh, this right here, this little chain link, this is a program enrollment that was a result of a referral to that program. The last thing I wanna show you on here is if you wanted to look at something specific like just services or just referrals, we can do that by going to the advanced search options. So when I click on this little view drop down arrow, I can, these are all the parameters that I can filter out some of this information. So for example, if I only wanted to see category, this is service categories. So let's say I only want to see services around case management. Um, I can also select the type assessments, programs, referrals, services, or reservation. So I'm going to select services. And for me, I don't care um, from what agency and I'm not giving it a predefined date range. So when I hit search, it will filter out everything except for uh, the services and I reset my thing. I wanted case management. So now here's all the case management services that this person received. And so what we have here is there was this one, which was a test. So on September 13th, 2018, they received this service. Here's my note. Um, they had case management service from December 20th to March 13th, 2020. So this is the date range. This is the first service they received. This is the last service. There could be no services in between or there could be multiple services in between. To know that because this is a date range, I would go over here and click on the edit button. It takes me into the actual service. Here's the start date and the end date. Here's the agency that was providing the service. And when I scroll down, the attendance or entries, this is how many different dates they received at that case management service. All right, going back into Our software is not liking me right now. Here we go. So kind of going back into that client, what I wanted to show you is uh, under the history, once I have filters set up, it will not clear until I clear my filters. So this is how I have my parameter set. If I go to another client, like going back to, I'm gonna to go to this client because I think they've got some, some stuff on there, this record. If I go back to history, my, my parameters are still here. So it's one thing to keep in mind is when you're going into multiple client records, if you, under the history tab, if you had set some filters on here, what you need to do is clear your filters so you can get your information back. So um, again, going back to Yolo County folks and that community queue referral, if someone needed to get 
if you did not see anything on the profile saying they had a community key referral or a housing referral, what we would want to do is go into the history page and find the community key referral if they have it. And if they do, what we want to do is we want to do a check-in. And so I'm going to do a check-in on this one, but typically what we're looking for is the community key referral. And if I wanted to do a check-in to keep that referral active, because they're still experiencing homelessness, I would click on the edit button on the referral. And where it says last activity, we want to click check in. This will keep that referral from timing out and expiring. So in the, the, this person's history, you'll see here was a community queue referral that expired. So if there is no activity after 90 days, that referral will expire. So we want to make sure that uh, if they're still experiencing homelessness, we're checking them in on that community queue referral. Um, I'm going to pretend like we don't have these housing um, referrals and I'm going to end this one. So to end um, a community queue referral, what we want to do is go down here and it's going to ask why. Um, maybe their whereabouts are unknown and because we've had no contact for 90 days and I'm going to say this happened on April 1st. And what that will do is end that community queue referral. When I'm in the referral system here, you'll see these are more tabs. We'll review more of this a little later. But if I want to get back to my client record, I just click on their name. And then going back to assessments, what you'll see is I don't have any pending referrals or the community queue referrals. So if I needed to get them back on the community queue, I would go back to assessments. I would scroll down to their VI spadat, click on eligibility, and then this button uh, is referred directly to the community queue. You'll see here's their scoring. Again, don't share this with the clients. When I click refer, refer to the community queue, there's a section where we can write notes. The notes you write here should be directed to the referral specialist. So for example, if this person had four dogs, this could um, this would be information they, the referral specialist would need when it comes to a housing referral. Uh, other things that would be very important is maybe a uh, client is in a wheelchair. This will be important information because if the housing opportunity was on a second floor uh, apartment building with no elevator, the person in the wheelchair would not be able to access that apartment. So we want to be sure that we're letting the referral specialist know things that would impact where they may be sending them a referral. When we, then we hit send referral. If I go back to history, here is my new community queue referral. Does anybody have any questions about the history tab or the assessments tab? So there was a question about the VI SPDAT training. So the VI SPDAT training is on Monday. It's from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, I have not sent out the Zoom link for that yet. I will be doing that uh, during the lunch break. Next week, we do have two other Zoom meetings, but they're not necessarily trainings. It's meant to be support to help you complete and pass the HMIS certification quiz so you can get access to your agency. Um, those are set for Thursday and Friday. Uh, both are set for one hour sessions. Um, if you want to attend those, you can sign in. Um, however, I'm asking that everybody who attends that has at least begun their vignette and that way you can have specific areas where you need assistance. Um, if you want to join those meetings and you have not be begun your vignette, I will be muting you to help folks that need specific help until there, uh, after that. And there's, if there's no questions, then uh, I will take other questions after that. 
Okay, services. Um, so I'm going to review a little bit of services and the programs tab and then we'll break for lunch. So again, keeping back on the global taskbar, we do have services available here. The services here should be services that are for um, things that we're giving, that we're providing to clients outside of a program enrollment. What that means is uh, maybe you've encountered them in the community or maybe they've come to your office and you're providing them a service but not enrolling them in your program, then this is where you would provide services. So typically what we should see when I click on services, um, and again, I'm in my training agency and there's some things to update. We would not see housing services or rental assistance here. These are errors, but maybe we have something like um, building trust and rapport or providing them food. It might be something that we would provide outside of a program enrollment. What you find here will be a, a much shorter list than the services you can provide within your program. So the next thing I want to show you is the programs tab. So when I click on programs, what you're going to see at the very top, this is the program history. So this is all the programs that this client has been enrolled in. Here's the name of the program. This is the agency that owns the program. Here is their start date. Uh, at, here is the end date. And if it says active, it means they're currently enrolled in that program. And then for type, we have two types. We either have individual or we have group. Individual is just that. Group means that there are multiple people enrolled in that program enrollment together. This little chain symbol right here, this is a uh, program enrollment that was um, connected to a referral that was sent to it. This is a private program enrollment, so where you see this padlock. And if we scroll all the way down, then we have programs available. Again, when we get down to here, this will be, this will vary depending on your agency. And again, just like on the assessment, this is the menu of programs that your agency offers, not necessarily all the programs that this person qualifies for or is eligible for or should even be in. This is just your menu. So when we want to enroll folks, we'll go down here to enroll them. Uh, but right now, I want to show you some things that are inside the program enrollments, and then we'll take our lunch. So to go into a program enrollment, what we want to do is click on the edit button next to it. Um, when you're in your own agencies, if you see programs like, for example, the city of West Sacramento, you will not have the edit button for that. You'll have what looks like an eyeball so you can view it, but you won't be able to edit it. You can only edit program enrollments if it's part of your agency and you are in it. So again, this kind of going back to if you are a, for example, a wind youth provider and you're a staff person that works with the wind youth projects, but also with the TLCS projects that you partner with, then you'll need to swap agencies so you can make edits or provide services or assessments within those programs. So to show you what it looks like inside there, so again, um, kind of going back to my uh, analogy of a book, Right now we're in the Lindsay test book. We're under the programs chapter. And then if we wanna go in the programs, the section on this one, we would click on the edit button. Once we're inside the program enrollment, again, you'll see here's the client name, here's the tab, then here is the name of the program that we're now working in. And once you're in here, what you'll see is when you go into an existing program enrollment, it always default to taking you to the history for that program. And so what you'll see here is services that have been provided. Uh, these are referrals um, that were sent from the agency. Uh, then we have the program enrollment screen. So we will be doing a program enrollment. And so when we click on enrollment, you'll see 
how all the questions, these are all the questions on an enrollment screen and this is what was answered at the time of enrollment. This is going to take us back to history as our always our starting point. We also have provide services, assessments, notes, files, forms, and exit. Enrollment, assessments, and exit are all going to take us to screens where they all nearly mirror each other. Uh, we are asking specific data elements like disabling conditions and barriers. We're asking information about income, non-cash benefits, health insurance, education and employment. These are all uh, meant to be uh, benchmark data that we are recording over time and how they change. Providing services, when I click on here, again, this is going to be taking us to our menu. And these are all the services that in this program that this agency says is able to offer within this program enrollment. And so these are categories. So when I go to case management documentation assistance and I click on the drop down menu to the right, you're going to see all the service items within this. So we can assist them with completing documentation for HUD. We can assist them with obtaining a birth certificate, ID, income verification all of these different things. And we will provide services after lunch today, after we've done our program enrollment. When we go to assessments, we can see them in two spots. Here is our menu at the top. That's why it says start. And then here's our history of what was conducted. You'll also see on the right hand side where we see status assessments, we can add them by clicking here. And these are ones that have been um, completed. Here's an annual assessment on 1220, and you'll see 1220 annual. Here's a status, this is 1220-2019, and here's 1220-2019. If we wanna see how the questions were answered, we can click on the edit buttons to the left here, or on the right-hand side um, next to these ones, then we click the edit buttons here. Then we have notes. These are notes that you can put in specific to your program. And it works just like um, on the global taskbar. You just click add note. Then we have files. And from file, we can either add a file just like we did up here on the, on the global taskbar, or we can link from files. And when we link from files, what this will do is we click on here it shows us all of the, the files that were in the global. And if we want to link them in, we just toggle it on and hit link and close. And then because they're already here, it doesn't do anything else. We also have forms available to us, but because we are limited to check boxes and signature lines only, most programs don't opt in on the forms. And then lastly, when we exit somebody, we want to complete the exit screen, which is found here. And so again, it's going to look very similar to the program enrollment screen, except for we're going to ask some information about where they, they exited to. Uh, on the right hand side of the screen, what I want to show you is this little box here. Uh, the 403 is this is how many days they're active in the program. So it, from this start date, it's been 403 days. If this was a closed or uh, ended program enrollment, this number will change and the box color will be red. And then it'll be how many days since they exited. This also tells you the, the program type. So they're in, enrolled in this program by themselves. This is the assigned staff person. And if I needed to change this or wanted to change it, there's an edit button here. And I would have a drop down menu for any available staff in this training agency to switch them to. I can also make the program and enrollment private by toggling this on and hit save changes. And what we should see is a little padlock show up, which is being a little slow. There's our padlock. And then for every program enrollment, just like the global household, we have to identify a head of household. So when we get back from our lunch and we enroll both our adult and our kid in the program, you'll see that we'll need to select a head of household. If someone is enrolled in a program with other, um, other global household members, you'll see there, those people in, listed here. And you can only include, 
people in a program group if they're part of the global household. So the first step when you are adding new members to a program enrollment, we need to first make sure they're part of the global household. Then we can add them to the program household. This little section right here is the assessments are due every year. Um, currently for this, the notification is turned off. If I want to turn it on, this is kind of like in your um, account settings we reviewed this morning. We want to hit save changes. So then it'll send you that notification email saying, hey, their annual assessment is due and I asked for a two week warning. Do we have any questions on this program review thus far? Again, when we get back, we'll actually be enrolling our, the test client in a program. We will be providing services, we'll be doing the assessments, and we'll be doing the program exits. Uh, there was a question about my comment with helping people who have begun what. So at the end of this training um, this evening, I will be sending out an email with links to the certification quiz. It is a two part quiz. There is a multiple choice section and then there's a vignette section. So when you do the quiz, it's going to be two Google Forms. The first Google Form is your multiple choice quiz. The second Google Form gives you the links to the training database. It'll give you your username and password for the training database, and it'll give you your vignette, so the information about your, your fake clients and the program enrollments. And the program enrollments will all be based on what program types you will actually be doing once you're let loose in HMIS. So my comment um, about the two sessions next week on Thursday and Friday, it is intended to help folks who are struggling with completing the vignette and need assistance. So what I am requesting is anybody may join, but if I have a, uh, if a person joins and they have not be begun their vignettes, I'm going to reserve um, questions for folks who've already begun the vignettes. And once all of that is done, then I'll ask specific questions for folks that have not started. Um, however, just be aware that that is not a, a time where I will be doing your vignette for you. It'll be, again, just asking, asking and answering specific questions. All of this is intended to be a learning opportunity. So when you are recording your data, you know how to record it and when to record it. So I'm going to break this for lunch. My clock says it is 1214. So um, I will say that our lunch has started at 1215 and we'll resume the training at uh, 115. So I hope you guys all have a good lunch. Be sure to get on your email to get the third Zoom link for today. And um, I do expect it will be done between 4 and 4.30 this afternoon. Uh, there's a question about when do you need to complete and turn in your certification? It's all done electronically. I recommend doing it as soon as you can so that way you can get access to the agencies that you need access to because you will not get access to HMIS until you have passed it. All right, I'm going to end this Zoom session.